Okay, guys, I think we're going to start. Welcome to a forum in which we're going to talk about know your farmer, know your food. Secretary Vilsack and I have been going around the country, and we like to say not every family needs an accountant, not every family needs a lawyer. Apologies to my husband, who is one. But every family needs a farmer. And then we like to add on the tagline, do you know yours? We had a very exciting week last week. We released the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food Compass and geospatial mapping tool. And John Carson, who's here in the White House working with the President, heads up our Office of Public Engagement, is here with me. And we want to talk about the tools that we released and all that you can do to find out more about ways USDA and the government as a whole can help you in the work that you're doing to build local regional food systems. So I have some ground rules first. Um, I'm supposed to say, usually when you start these things, you can say, turn off your cell phones. In this case, don't. I mean, this is, this is really supposed to be you know, your phones, whatever your electronic devices are, we're, we're tweeting. We're tweeting all over the place. Um, you can post pictures, uh, live blog, using the hashtag, hashtag KYF2. Know your farmer, know your food. KYF, KYF, KYF2. If you're watching online and you don't have a Twitter account, we still want to hear from you. Send our team email at knowyourfarmer at usda.gov. Know your farmer being no spaces in between those words. Um, if you're in the room uh, and we're going to have conversations, we will get you to a microphone when speaking and when you, we call on you, tell us who you represent, if anyone. Uh, and uh, we have uh, seven different themes that we have in the Know Your Farmer Compass, and we'll go through those sequentially as they appear on our website. Um, but we can take breaks and talk about whatever the room wants to talk about. Um, today's video feed will be available later on on youtube.com slash White House. So those are my, those are my uh, marching orders, John. But um, I just want to say that uh, things are really, really exciting. We, um, we introduced the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food Compass via a live webcast. Yeah. Secretary Vilsack and I were plowing new ground doing that. We didn't know how it would work, but we have a, had about 3,200 people watch us live, and now it's going to be on YouTube so people can get that introductory uh, tool to the, the compass anytime they want. Um, we've had probably over 14,000 people actually dig deep into the compass document and the geospatial map, and we just released it on Wednesday afternoon last week. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, people are finding it of value. And what I'd like to do is, um, is uh, talk a little bit about it. But first, I want to say that you and I have something in common. Yeah. Yeah. You grew up on a farm? I did. And I grew up in a farming community. Now, my dad, he was a school teacher. We were, were not in, on the farm, but in the weekends, he in the summer, he worked at Agway. He sold farmer supplies. Mm -hmm. So it was part of my family income. Grew up next door to a farm, a farm that eventually gave way to commercial mm -hmm development, which was really sad, but at a certain point I did know my farmer, his name was Mr. Roberts. Uh -huh. And you grew up on a farm, and so we're connected because we yes. were both really close to the land. I, I did know my farmer, uh, Kathleen, he was my grandfather. Uh, just this last summer my parents got to go to the Wisconsin State Fair where they received a plaque for the farm being in the family for a hundred years. Uh, and I keep a picture of that farm uh, on my desk uh, here in the White House. So I, I just really want to thank the Deputy Secretary for putting this together for the folks who are in the room. We, and those of you watching on whitehouse.gov uh, uh, live, we do a lot of different events here, but this one, uh, for the reasons we just talked about, is so exciting to me personally. And it's also um, an issue that we need everyone's help getting the word out about. As you said, we deal with a lot of different issues here at the White House. Some are interesting to people. Uh, some have very niche categories, but everyone cares about this. Everyone, if they don't know their farmer, they should know their farmer. And I also think this is just such an incredibly exciting example of how government works best. Government being a partner with businesses, government being a, the federal government partner with local governments, um, and really highlighting and making concrete uh, what this is all about. Um, I, uh, having grown up on a farm, uh, the first paycheck I ever got was for uh, baling hay. Uh, my neighbor's farm, I had, my grandpa didn't pay me that, that came with uh, being in the family. <laughs> um, and to this day here living in DC, um, I do know my farmer now as well. We're part of a local, um, uh, uh, a local um, 
food organization that our milk is actually delivered. Um, I got to take my three-year-old and my one-year-old uh, to South Mountain Creamery uh, to see where that milk comes from. So the support that USDA is giving to these efforts across the country is fantastic. Should we take a look? Yeah, uh, let's at take the map? a look. So um, first, I want to tell people what's right behind me is the website for the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food Compass document and geospatial map. You get a little opening video there where, among other things, I was at Butler's Orchards, and we'll talk about that um, momentarily. Uh, and then you'll see the whole compass guide. On the left, that navigation tool, you'll see the different themes that we'll talk about uh, in the course of this hour and a half uh, meeting that we're having. Um, really, these are great documents. They are full of case studies, um, proof points, and they're going to be regularly refreshed. So don't think if you look at this document, it's a one-time look-see. Uh, intentionally, we didn't print out any copies. Uh, we, we downloaded a few copies for the Hill. They wanted a traditional report for congressional members. But this is meant to be an electronic document um, that will constantly be repopulated as new stories come our way. So I do want people to realize this is a continuing resource for you all. So we'll talk about the, the compass, and, um, and it's been a work of the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food initiative, which is a USDA-wide task force. Every agency and major sta staff office is involved. So it's had many, many hands, um, but it's very lush visually. It's very beautiful. I think people will enjoy reading it. And there are tons of hyperlinks embedded in the document, so it brings you to various studies that are relevant. Uh, resource guides. There's a lot of there's a lot of richness to it, so people should take the time. But what I'd like to do, John, yes. is actually go over to the geospatial map. Yeah. If my crack staff pulls this off, and I understand you're from Wisconsin, yeah, and from, we'd like uh, to see where you're from. Right there, I believe uh, the Westby Co-op Creamery is part of the uh, Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food right. initiative. Best so, cheese curds in Wisconsin, by the way. A <laughs> little advertisement, I suppose. Yeah. So this is the geospatial map. If people haven't seen it. Um, what you do is you can go right to your county. I've spent a lot of time in Massachusetts, where I am. And you can see the uh, dots on the map are various kinds of USDA investments. Oh, I just want, Amanda, if you oh, slow yeah. down there, so or, um, see it says three of three. You can go back, go back here. And so I want people to realize that you need to sometimes go through. If you hit that yeah. point and one slide comes up, you need to pay attention to that number in the corner because there might be multiple things on that dot. So this is telling us about seasonal high tunnels, how many investments at that zip code. And you want us to go down to another one, though. Okay, we'll go down to another one. John, where's your dot that you yeah, want us to see? It's uh, this one right here. That blue one there? Uh, no, no, one more down. down. One more down. There we go. Now it's uh, a little further down, I think. Or maybe it's the next it one. It might be the next slide. There it is. The Westby Co-op Creamery. All right. So what did they receive? If we go down, we scroll down, we received, they received a $300,000 value-added producer grant from the Rural Business Service, which is part of our rural development mission area. And this helped them to um, put in some infrastructure. And uh, if you go back up a little bit, that's the end of that scroll, right? Yeah. If you hit more information, what do we hit, guys? We hit that hyperlink. Okay, you go right to the place. So these hyperlinks, when you go to the map and it says more information, if that place actually has a website and we're able to find it, it'll bring you there and you can find out more information on your own. In some cases, it will bring you back to the USDA program where the funding was received. In all cases, you can also go to the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food blog, which you also see in that navigational plane when you engage that website for the first time. And on the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food blog under uh, resources, and actually on the navigation plane too, where it says, um, where is it? There you go. Grants, loans, and other resources. That's a, that will bring you to a lot of hyperlinks that will talk about what USDA programs are available for help in local regional and, and, and give you some ideas about how they've been used before. And, and I would just like to take this moment to encourage everyone here in the room with us today, everyone following on whitehouse.gov slash live, anyone joining us via Twitter, help us tell this story through your personal connection. Um, 
following what's happening where I grew up in western Wisconsin, an area that really saw the devastation of the farm crisis in the early 1980s, and seeing what this approach to agriculture has meant to the local economy, um, Organic Valley is now the number one employer in the county where I grew up. Um, the whole notion of organic farming, sustainable, the local food movement not really being something we ever even discussed in the early, early 80s when the farm crisis was hitting. So I'm going to take these links, take this story, uh, take the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food website and spread it out to the circles of people that I interact with, whether they're interested in these issues or not, and really encourage each and every one of you, find that local story that connects to you and, and help spread the word. Now, one of the questions that the secretary and I got on the webcast, we didn't get to all the questions. They were mm -hmm. coming in fast and um, furious, was from Bob Purcell. The question was, are only USDA participants listed in this compass? Um, currently, the answer is yes. So what this first generation of the map uh, does, and Stephen Lowe is with me, um, who is our head geospatial information officer at USDA, and he and his team did a marvelous job on this. Um, what this shows is USDA investments. So all of these dots, or in the shading, the density shading where we're talking about EBT capacity at our farmers markets, those investments, or if we're talking about seasonal high tunnels, which is also, um, you can see by density shading, those are all, USDA has had a, a real role in it. But that's the first um, iteration of the map. We expect that we will soon get to phase two. Phase two of the map, we plan on embedding these investments in some USDA data sets we have. So for example, we have a farmer's market directory. And we have over 7,000 farmer's markets. People have volunteered that information. We have that database. Well, some of those USDA had a, a role in. Many more we did not. But wouldn't it be nice if you're interested in local regional to have that context for Absolutely. the USDA investment? So we have many, many data layers that we plan on uh, putting on in the second phase of the map. Um, we have a team working together talking about what those layers should be. We haven't f come with a final vetting, but we'd like to see that. I'm, Stephen's all nervous, I'm gonna say a date. It, it would be a month that begins with the letter M, and it's not March, <laughs> would, would be our hope. Um, so, so people will see what, what the context is. And then later on, to go to Bob Purcell's question, can producers update their own pages or will USDA? Well, of course, if you've been a, the beneficiary of USDA help and the, your website is there for more info, you can always update your website. But in terms of actually putting yourself in different ways on the map, we haven't crossed that bridge yet. Um, so. Well, and just one final point I want to make sure uh, to mention is how excited the President himself, the First Lady, and the whole team here at the White House uh, is about Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food. The President um, made sure there was a quote uh, for the report, which is, I think, on the front page of the, web page of the website. And of course, here at the White House, we also know our farmer as well uh, with the First Lady's uh, vegetable garden that she's put on the South Lawn. Oftentimes, when we're eating at the White House mess, they'll make sure to mention that some of those greens or the vegetables of the day uh, came straight from the First Lady's garden, which I think has really had an impact on us here and helped her uh, inspire others to be a part of this. I know our White House chef, Sam Cass, feels the same way, so uh, we'll all be anxiously checking for updates as well. Great. All right, well, John, if you don't mind, let's go through some of Sounds the themes good. in the document. So um, the first thing that you, after we sort of throw, lay out the case, why should you care about local foods? You know, what does it mean for uh, farmland preservation, particularly with 40% of our farmers now in metro counties? It is a very important way that you, you maintain farmland. Um, why is it important in terms of job creation? We have some studies from our economic research service that we cite. Why is it important to get healthy food access in communities? We have a basic opening salvo that sort of describes why local foods, why does it matter? But then we go into specific themes, and the first one is infrastructure. And um, we've had 54% growth uh, between 2008 and 2011 in farmers markets, and a lot of us cite that statistic, but it's much more than farmer's markets. When we're talking local regional food, the secretary always likes to say, someone needs to grow it, someone needs to process it, package it, transport it, market it, sell it at retail, um, and all of this can contribute to a local economy. But it is resource uh, challenging. We've got a lot of different programs, farmer's market promotion program, food hub program that we're working on. 
Um, a lot of effort at USDA to help farmers build cooperatives, which can be a really important strategy. Um, in the report, we talk about some of our investments in commercial kitchens, which can help small guys who don't quite have the capacity to do their own commercial scale kitchen to use and share equipment. There's a great example in Nevada. I went to Nevada once and said Nevada, but you don't do that. You say Nevada. Yeah. The whole audience hissed at me. It was really something. Um, Nevada, where uh, a rural community economic corporation got money to purchase two trucks through our um, RBEG program and rural development. Um, and sometimes there will be things in the report where it's not USDA actually being a funder, but where we're a customer. The Virginia Food Hub, the Food Hub in Virginia and Charlottesville, we're a customer. We buy some of their food in our USDA cafeteria. So um, there's a lot of great things for people to look at. Um, I would say that uh, the Value Added Producer Grant Program is a really great tool. Uh, we have a big Food Hub piece of work that's going to be released next week. Again, keep going to the website, into the Compass, because this is a, this is an evolving document. But I really want to um, call on, if she's here, Amanda Oborn. Is Amanda here from Ecotrust? Okay. And Amanda, I don't know where the mic is, how this is going to work. Who's going to, do we have a mobile, do you have a mobile mic? Or is, it's, uh, okay, someone had to um, pioneer here. Okay, there's one on each side. Amanda, I just wanted to know a little bit about what, you know, in terms of your expertise, you're in Oregon with Ecotrust, knowing the work that you've done um, and you've got this big food hub effort. Tell us a little bit about it, a couple minutes, and tell us what you think some of the key challenges are that USDA can help, uh, help people with. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the invitation to participate today. I'm thrilled to be here. I work for Ecotrust, which is a nonprofit based in Portland, and we have a project called Food Hub that I manage. That's capital F, capital H. <laughs> Not to be confused with food hubs generally. It's basically a virtual food hub, by, according to the USDA's definition. And it's a tool where chefs, restaurateurs, uh, school food service directors, or hospital, school food, or hospital food service directors, can get online and find producers, farmers, ranchers, fishermen, dairies in their area and make contact directly. So the biggest challenge that we've found in, in building up Food Hub across the six states in the Northwest that we cover is distribution and infrastructure. So I'm really glad to hear that that's one of the main focuses of the department right now. Um, so we help buyers and sellers find each other and connect and do business, but those buyers and sellers still need to work out their own distribution system between the two of them. So our hope is that as we look at collaborating with other innovators across the country, that we'll be able to develop a distribution system that supports the Food Hub Network. So let me ask you, we've had one of the subcommittees, so to speak, of the Know Your Farmer Task Force has been on Food Hubs. I know we have a, a website now in the Ag Marketing Service specifically for Food Hubs. Uh, hopefully they've been talking with you. Uh, yes, it's. I think we're all getting to know each other and, and finding all the in different innovations that are going on around the country. So yeah, I'm excited about that. For those of you, thank you very much. For those of you who may not be totally familiar with food hubs, um, the older version maybe, market terminals. We also have a really important study underway at market, market terminals across, across the country trying to figure out where um, capacity may be for people who want to find a place where they can aggregate product, process it, do some light processing, get it into the scale, the size that institutional buyers need. And so that's part of our work. And um, we've had a team uh, really working very, very hard on it. I don't know if that's come across in any of your conversations, John, about infrastructure needs, but it's big for us. Well, one thing, uh, when it comes to the approach that you're taking, uh, we're talking to a lot of other agencies who have, um, who purchase uh, food um, across the country to make sure as often as possible they're part of these solutions as well. Great. I also know I have Nancy Kramer here. Nancy, you've been involved with the 10% campaign in North Carolina. So tell us a little bit about, um, from where you sit, what what the challenges are in infrastructure and what's going on in North Carolina. Yeah, I'm, I'm with um, the Center for Environmental Farming Systems and we're a collaborative between North Carolina State University, North Carolina A&T State University and the Department of Ag. 
The 10% campaign is asking individuals and businesses to pledge 10% of their food dollar to local food, which would mean $3.5 billion to the state's economy. So we have big businesses, uh, universities, county governments all signing up for that. And USDA has been instrumental in, they didn't fund that program, but they're funding all the work that's going around that to develop the infrastructure and, and those kinds of things. We have a, a beginner farmers grant that's working to develop a network of incubator farms with county governments, a new farmers market promotion program grant um, to increase food access, and an AFRI grant pending to work on the infrastructure in particular. Thanks. I have a 10% campaign t-shirt, I believe, that I, I sport around great. in the gym. <laughs> I that's hope great. I don't do discredit to your great cause there when I'm wearing it. I'm trying to work that uh, treadmill. Yeah, Co Cooperative Extension is a big part of that cam campaign, and they have designated a local food coordinator in every county in the state, North Carolina. Oh, great. Well, we'll get you back up here, Nancy. I want to remind people that you can ask questions via hashtag KYF2. Um, I'm going to take a qu couple of questions on infrastructure after I tell uh, one tale of one of my favorite projects. So, John, I'm from western Massachusetts, right near the Vermont border. So I'm as close to Brattleboro, Vermont, as I am to, well, that's the big city where yeah. I'm from. And uh, anyhow, I was really excited that uh, the Brattleboro Food Co-op, which is a $17 million business, it's not a little mm -hmm. tiny co-op, they already support 142 farmers. They got a business and industry loan guarantee. They are constructing a huge building right on the corner, the foot of Main Street, down from Sam's Army and Navy, where my family buys a lot of stuff. And it's beautiful. And it's going to mean ma many more retail opportunities for local farmers. So that's an uh, opportunity, business and industry loan guarantee, which uh, congressional um, folk in the 2008 Farm Bill put a 5% set aside in for local and regional food. So we've so far only achieved about 2% spend out in that program for local regional. We need to get up to 5%, so we need some more demand. These are definitely some of the best success stories that we're seeing in small town and rural America across the country and would encourage folks following along online, send us those stories just like the Deputy Secretary did and we'll help uh, post them on obviously the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food webpage and, and the whitehouse.gov blog as well. Okay, so now I'm going to, oh, whoa. So anyhow, okay, I'll, I'll blush and I'll be a fan. So a little, a bit before we started this, um, at Jason Mraz. Jason Mraz said, I'm stoked about Know Your Farmer. What can I do to help? And if you don't know who Jason Mraz is, <laughs> out of here. Um, so he, I'm one of his biggest fans. That's, that's really great. Um, what, can we, what can he do to help? What y'all can do to help is get the word out. Uh, this has been a coming out party in some ways for USDA in terms of the investments that we've been making over the last three years on local regional. And we need people to know about it. And we also need people to connect the dots, literally. So if there's not a dot in your area and you want a dot, this is a resource that explains to you how people are utilizing USDA programs. It's also going to be an incredibly great resource for us internally at USDA because we don't necessarily know across all the different agencies what each other is doing. But now we see it in a very, very transparent way. So it's transparent externally. It's also more transparent than anything really we've done internally, too, because all of the 17 agencies at USDA and the many staff offices can see what their, um, what their investments mean across the whole panoramic uh, work of USDA. All right, now, um, I've got all kinds of questions here. I don't know if there's any order that you want me to take these in. Anything in particular on infrastructure? They're all mixed in. Okay. All right. Um, at FHCASA, are there plans to add features to the grants loan page, calendar of deadlines, searchable by type of program eligibility? Um, that will be, that, that information will continue to be pumped out through the KYF blog. So the, the compass will continue to be more of a results document and hyperlink you to important studies. The map will be things that have happened. But in terms of grant announcements, you'll continue to look at that on USDA's main page, usda.gov, but also the KYF blog, where we try to 
hype whatever available grants are out there and deadlines. So for example, I assume, I know for certain that soon we will have a grant announcement on farm to school, a result of the Health or Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act that our first lady worked so hard to get passed. Mm -hmm. There's a farm to school program in that. And so uh, we will have a grant availability announcement um, I'm not exactly sure, but sometime this spring, so schools can apply before the school year ends. We would feature that on USDA's website, but we'd also feature it on the Know Your Farmer blog. And people can go in and they can sign up. RF, R, RSS feed, I know. She's trying to teach an old dog new tricks. It's not easy. So that way you can always have that alert system in your email box if you'd like. And just one uh, broader website I'd mentioned for folks interested in uh, how the federal government can be a partner is grants.gov, uh, www.grants.gov, a much more cross-cutting uh, cross section of uh, opportunities. <coughs> Here's a question at H-B-O-T-T-E-M-I-L-L-E-R. A lot of consumers think local food tends to be safer as local and regional food gives uh, grows, how is food safety part of the conversation? For example, even though many small farms are exempt from the forthcoming food safety legislation, FDA, GAP is still important. Um, yeah, well, uh, certainly no one gets a pass in food safety in my mind. I don't care if you're the biggest farmer in the world or the smallest. We all have to achieve very high levels of food safety. The president in fact, my boss, Tom Vilsack, always said, well, I got the boss, the big boss, and then, you know, yeah. Uh, so Secretary Vilsack, get myself in trouble here. Secretary Vilsack said one of his first meetings, if not the first meeting with the president, was talking about the importance of food safety. So this White House, this administration takes food safety um, very, very seriously. But there are different ways of getting there. And one of the things that um, we funded that uh, through the Risk Management Agency was working with FamilyFarm.org. Um, it's one of many things that we've done. And what they did was they developed a, a food safety planning tool. It's free to farmers. So you can go on to the website and you can, um, it'll ask you questions, kind of like TurboTax, if you ever use TurboTax when it's uh, tax filing season, as some of us know. Um, and it asks you particular questions, you fill it in, and at the end you hit print and you get your food safety plan. And it really helps farmers navigate, get the kind of stuff together. It makes them think, triggers all the questions. So we are doing a lot, I think, to help small farmers. Because if you're vending into school, farm to institution situation, or um, it, even if you're just doing direct at a farmer's market, of course you want to high, have high levels of food safety. So we're trying to develop uh, tools to help people out. John, I'm going to go to our next theme. Excellent. Stewardship. Hmm. So uh, we want to make sure our conservation portfolio is accessed by and works for local growers. And um, Chief Dave White of the Natural Resources Conservation Service came to me early on and said, seasonal high tunnels. I had no idea what he was talking about. They're called hoop houses where I live. Um, these temporary greenhouse-like structures. In fact, you know what? Uh, if, if you guys can roll that video of um, Zach and George, Georgia, this is a farm, ladies and gentlemen, in Virginia where we announced the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food initiative back in 2009 at a picnic table with a bunch of bloggers. Um, they were on leased land and things have changed for them. But I'm going to show it to you because it shows uh, what hoop houses look like. Hi, Deputy Secretary Merrigan. This is Zach Lester. We're here at Tree and Leaf Farm in Unionville, Virginia. It's been two and a half years since I've seen you. We were trying to get a USDA mortgage. Obviously, we got the mortgage. Hit the ground running, put up our tunnels. Went through the craziest winter ever to keep our greenhouses up, and we were back at market in April 2010. We're growing year-round, things are going well, our winter markets are really strong. We're revitalizing and remineralizing our soil, so we're happy. Thank you very much. Know your farmer, know your food. That's me, and this is my son, Owen Lester.
couldn't get better in that story, no. huh, John? So um, we have helped farmers across the country through our Environmental Quality Incentive Program uh, put these hoop houses on their land. It lets them get the crop in earlier, keep some crops in later, so you extend your growing season. Great for local regional. It's also really important as a conservation tool because it helps with uh, input, so you don't need as many. Um, nutrient management, nutrient flow. So they're really a great, great thing. Uh, we've funded about 4,500 of these across the country. It started as a pilot program. Just recently we announced it's going to be a permanent practice nationwide. So farmers in every state should be able to get access to these. Um, we also uh, have the Farm and Ranch Land Protection Program where USDA partners with states and tribes, local governments, local land trusts to um, try to preserve farmland, which is really, really important. Uh, the Compass will also talk about agroforestry. The head of our agroforestry at USDA likes to say it's the right tree at the right time for the right purpose. But it's as a, as a strategy, as a diversica diversification strategy in this country, probably underutilized. Um, talks about people's gardens. Uh, we are trying to get people's gardens across the country. USDA took uh, a jackhammer to the parking lot at the corner of our building and put a people's garden. Um, the first lady, I think, did a little bit better. Garden's a little <laughs> bit better, but don't tell the secretary I said I that. Um, it's a beautiful garden, both places. But we then asked all of USDA employees to try to put people's gardens on their properties. And then we have a lot of community partners. So we are now seeing thousands of gardens. And there is a place on our website where you can register your people's garden if it's something that you're doing with a community, a community-based garden. Um, we're also doing a lot of research on local seeds and breeds, which is really important, adapting to the local place. Um, I wanted to call on a young man whose farm I visited recently who is also in a video on the main website when you first come into the Compass, uh, Tyler Butler of Butler Orchard. So, um, there's a farm, a family farm that's been doing direct sales since the 1950s. Tyler, tell us a little bit about your operation. Yes, so you came out to the farm and we filmed an awesome commercial and um, my high tunnel wasn't full of anything quite yet, but uh, we have a 300 acre pick your own fruit and vegetable farm that started in 1950 and we are so lucky to be so close to DC and we have such a great population of people that are interested in knowing their farmer. So as a young grower, I realized that um, there's not much of us out there and I really appreciate everything that the government's doing now for all young farmers who don't have what I have. I have a family to come back to, a business already in the ground. But uh, getting this funding for high tunnels, for most people out there, that's great. It's an easy program, and um, I've got tomatoes going in mine. And soon enough, I hopefully I'll have more than that. So I'll have five tunnels, and we'll be doing organic soon. So there's lots of room to grow, and the help that you guys give us is, is really great. Well, great. Now tell me, you are a 2008 graduate from the University of Maryland, as mm -hmm. I recall. Yes. So I graduated from Maryland in 2008 in horticulture and crop production, came back to the farm, and I have all these ideas, and I couldn't use them. And then we got this grant, and they said, okay, since you're getting some help, you can do it. And so now I'm, I got leverage. I'm ready to go. And uh, is, there's, there's lots of things that are, that are going to be coming here soon. And your brother? You have a brother in school? I've got school? a brother, and I've got my sister back on the farm. And so we're, everyone's there, and... We do pick your own uh, fruits and vegetables, and we used to do pick your own potatoes and all kinds of stuff. So um, what we do at our farm is we get people out to our farm so they can get the experience, and they really, they really get to know the farmer and get to know the land. So um, it's a really great thing that when we see somebody come from D.C. or from other areas around the country, they have no idea where their food's coming from, and, hey, this strawberry plant is right down there, and that's what you're eating, and, and go after it. Because I don't want to pick it. I want you to pick it. So <laughs> they have fun doing it. We have fun watching them, and it's a great experience for everybody. And that's, that's what we really do at our farm. It's experience, and, and it's, it's great. great. I'm going to have to get your address so I can bring my kids up. Sure, there yep. oh, right down the road. you got to tell John, what is that thing you do with the pumpkins? You blast them, or what is this? Oh, yeah, we can shoot a pumpkin pretty far. We have a big uh, I'm pumpkin I'm definitely junket. coming for that. <laughs> we'll put you down by the targets. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Well, I just want to take a minute to thank USDA for their leadership on the whole issue of stewardship. On Friday, uh, Secretary Vilsack, Secretary <coughs> Salazar, and the President hosted a conference on conservation across the country. And what I think is so exciting is that I think the old way of thinking of land conservation was 
taking land and putting it out of bounds and, and keeping people away from it. But the new conversation, USDA is front and center playing a leading role. And, and that was what was so exciting on Friday, seeing the conversations taking place between farmers and ranchers, them being part of the solution to land conservation, everything from keeping the Chesapeake Bay clean um, to, to uh, projects like this. So thank you for your leadership on that. Um, and uh, anything we can do to help highlight that would be great too. Oh, great. Well, you know, it's not just local farmers, all farmers. It's just really keeping farming in business mm -hmm. is really important to our environment. I remember many, many years ago at Tufts University, we hosted a conference. Uh, Kate Clancy's in the room. I think you were involved, Kate, called Environmental Enhancement Through Agriculture. Uh, a lot of times people think it's like yeah, this, but not necessarily. It doesn't have to be. And when you look at the just the Chesapeake Bay and you look at the, the mm -hmm. storm drain runoff from urban communities versus either the runoff in farms, we all need to do better, but it really makes the case that you want to keep those farms in business. Absolutely. I have a couple of questions that have come my way. Are you able to search educational farms and farmer incubator programs with the new Compass feature? Uh, uh, um, Sophia Marvell from Brickyard Educational Farm. Um, hey there. Uh, yes, you are. Uh, uh, things that have been funded through our beginning farmer and rancher program uh, those grants are up on the website, and a lot of those are funding educational programs. And you actually are sitting next to Stephanie Ritchie, who has done a marvelous job in, co in collaboration with the Farm Bureau, the American Farm Bureau Federation, to have a program called Start to Farm, which is also a great tool for people on our website to turn to. So there's a lot of interest in beginning in um, uh, Oh, now I'm looking at the screen. Okay. Uh, Jody Mason says, our research shows U.S. consumers yearn to know who grows their food, but they shop most at supermarkets. What can supermarkets do for KYF2? I got a lot of ideas. So a recent study by the National Grocers Association found that 85% of Americans factor in whether their grocery offers up local food as a factor in deciding where they shop. So it seems like smart business means figuring out a way to not only bring in food from your local growers, but finding a way to hype it. I think local groceries, groceries could have uh, days when they bring farmers into the store. They could have posters up about their farmers. They could have a farmer's market on their lot. When I first heard that HEB in Texas did this, I thought, well, that's taking away from their own produce department. They found it just got people in the produce mode, and they actually oh. sold more. Um, there's all kinds of things. They can use community rooms. A lot of grocery stores have uh, community spaces where they could bring in USDA field staff. They'll host uh, seminars about how to access our resources. There's all kinds of things they can do. Grocery stores are major pillars in our communities, and we want them involved. I'll tell a quick personal story that, that backs you up there. When I, uh, another farm story, when I was eight years old, the pumpkin story reminded me of this. I learned about capitalism that way. Uh -huh. um, I sold to our local supermarket all the pumpkins I raised on our field for a dollar a piece and then was surprised when I showed up at the supermarket to see them for sale for $3 a piece. Mm -hmm. But I did tell all my friends at school to go buy those pumpkins because they were mine. So it does work. Excellent, excellent. Well, of course, the local regional thing is really important for farmers' bottom line. ERS regularly updates uh, what we call the food dollar and to show you what percent actually goes directly to the farmer. And it varies between 13 and 18 cents. But when I'm spending that dollar at the grocery store, not so much as going necessarily back to the farmer, and that's one of the things that we're trying to, to deal with. The next section of the report thematically is local meat. And uh, I remember early on in my job as deputy, I went to a meeting in a, uh, up in New England, and they were talking about it might take 18 months to get an animal to a slaughter facility. Uh, hard to grow out an animal that lives a very short period of time yes. to the right, uh, the right size and, and all for 18 months. And, uh, and also a lot of interest in mobile units uh, up in my part of the world. And they found that the Food Safety Inspection Service at USDA wasn't saying green light. They said, no, nah, you know, they got mixed messages at best. So in, in further research on mobile units, I found out that yes, they're OK, but at that time, U USDA rules were unclear. And in terms of the meat capacity, it's complicated. 
it's complicated. And when you turn to the compass, you'll find out that um, we started in this initiative by doing a mapping project where we tried to map all the slaughter capacity around the country um, to figure out where the holes are. And that map is available up on our, our website. And in that second phase of the mapping, when we started to put context data in, that will be one of the things that we will flood into the map. Um, I think it will really help. But when I, I recently looked at the 2011 2011-12 um, SARE uh, report from the field that just came out, they highlighted a graduate student, Arian, I'm going to butcher his name, Thimbomary. He's, I, he was Iowa State. He got SARE funding for his research. His hypothesis was that there were two a uh, few small-scale meat processors. But what he found was it was also more of a coordination issue and resource issue. You got aging food processors in the yeah. slaughter facilities. They're the people, like everything in agriculture, yeah. they're aging. And they also have the extreme boom and bust for the seasonality of, of meat, which you're very familiar yes. with in Wisconsin because mm -hmm. that's probably one of the places that has the most small slaughter plants in the country. He leveraged his initial SARE grant because of all the interest in this into $500,000 for his research. And when he became one of the people who started the Niche Meat Processors Assistance Network, um, he put out the whole animal buying guide and SARE put out a guide how to direct market your beef, all great resources that you can find in the compass. We also talk a lot about um, mobile meat. Um, we put out a compliance guide so people would know what the rules were clear, black and white, not gray. Uh, we did webinars on what these rules are and also what RD, rural development money, might be available to help people uh, fund these uh, local slaughter facilities. And we have a lot of success stories in the Compass. Um, in April 2011, you'll see a study that's in the Compass uh, where in Iowa they explored small-scale meat processing and they found that for every $1 million in small meat processor output, they required 13.3 jobs. So they did a whole analysis. What does this mean for the local economy that people can read? So local meat for me, it's jobs, diversification strategy uh, for risk. It's, um, it's finding out how to recouple animals and livestock, uh, animals and, and crop production for nutrient cycling. Uh, and it's a place where I don't think there's any um, greater need for that national discussion about where your food comes from because mm -hmm. people are really they've romanticized or disconnected with the farm and livestock agriculture and so I think it would um, it really help if we have that conversation now I want to call in some people in the audience but before we do that I want to I saw Sam Cass is in the house and Sam is one of our dear friends he leads the uh, first lady's uh, food policy efforts and uh, we, we got a mic for you. Pull up a chair. Yeah, you, get, you got some time for us? All right. <laughs> Put them right in the middle. Sandwich them. How's it going, everybody? Good, good. We're having to tweet up, Sam. I'm 52 years old, and I'm doing it. I love tweet ups. I tweeted for the first time just a couple weeks ago, if you can believe it. Jason Mraz is in the house. It was, <laughs> nice. Yeah, he's tweeting with us. Nice. It's great. Uh, uh, it's been great. <laughs> this is exciting, huh? Yeah. Um, can I say just a couple of things? Yeah, please. Um, so the, one of the very first things that the First Lady did when she got to the White House was plant a, plant a garden on the South Grounds, uh, which today uh, seems like, uh, you know, of course she did that, right? It seems like you can't imagine the White House now without uh, a vegetable garden. Um, um, but back then, you know, it was not the conventional wisdom. And this is something that she wanted to do because she knew firsthand as a mom the importance of, uh, of, of kids and families knowing where their food comes from, uh, highlighting the role uh, of the people who grow it and the hard work and dedication that it takes to grow food and feed this nation, um, and how the relationship between those people and, and, and families who consume uh, food is so important. And she, you know, uh, she would take kids to the farmer's market uh, in Chicago and really they started cooking and really learning about all this kind of all this kind of stuff and that really shaped uh, her perspective and is why that was just such been you know her priority and out of that garden grew um, let's move and all the work and and know your farmer know your food uh, is, is is exemplary of, of all this 
dedication and commitment by the administration uh, to this set of issues and to just how fundamentally important these connections are to uh, ensuring that our nation is vibrant, both in our economy and in our health. So Kathleen, I want to congratulate you on just amazing uh, set of work over the last three years. It's been just a extraordinary what, you've, uh, what you guys have accomplished over there um, and to the Secretary as well. And, uh, and I think uh, this is just the beginning of a lot of great, great work. And this is, you know, we're keeping up with the rest of the country. Uh, this is happening all over the nation. Uh, uh, there isn't a city or a town or a mayor who we talk to who isn't working with a set of stakeholders to, to deal with all kinds of different requests from community government. We just met with leaders from Jackson, Mississippi. The mayor has made a commitment that in each neighborhood there will be a city uh, supported community garden where they're giving the seeds to the community. Wow. Just That's Jackson, Mississippi. I mean, every time we meet with leaders, this is what uh, we're hearing. Uh, I have a good friend who tore up a football field in, in, in Texas to plant food to help support uh, community college. Uh, this stuff is happening everywhere, uh, and it's just really exciting. So um, we're, we're, we're deeply connected, and we feel like there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of great work yet to be done, but we're really proud of what the administration has done to support this effort. Great. What, what are you harvesting in the garden right now? Um, so we, that's right, we, um, we are harvesting uh, a lot of kale. We grow all year round. We have low tunnels uh, out, in the, out in the garden. Um, so we are harvesting, we just harvest some incredible spinach, kale, chard, um, um, let's see, um, bok choy, some amazing bok choy, mustard greens. I have the most amazing mustard greens ever uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, we have broccoli that's just about to be taken out, collard greens, uh, and lots of lettuce, tons of lettuce. Um, and we'll be, we're getting ready for our spring planting. And so the other thing that, that we'll see in the coming months is the First Lady is, uh, has written a book uh, called American Grown. Um, and it's going to be a book that highlights and tells her story and evolution of these issues, um, but also the story of what's happening all over the country and highlighting amazing, amazing work happening everywhere uh, that we run across. Sometimes we go to highlight it, and sometimes you just come upon it, uh, an amazing garden that a science teacher built with with her class or, or a faith leader who's dedicated extra land to, to helping to grow food and improving access to healthy, affordable food. Um, so, you know, we're going to be, this book is going to be beautiful uh, and amazing, uh, filled with recipes, how-to tips about um, how to plant a garden, how to plant a children's garden, how to do it on your windowsill, how to do it in your back porch, how to do it in your backyard, um, how to do it in a school. and. And it's just going to be both a great tool, but also a great visual and a great story. So we're very excited to, so stay tuned for that. It's exciting. Yeah, it's very good. All right, well, when you came in, I was just about to call on Drew, and then stick, stick for a minute, because yep. I want to go to Farm to Institution, which you have so much um, to say. And, but I wanted to call on Drew Peters, who's the owner of Sunnyside Farm in Dover, Pennsylvania. I know a PASA member. Nice. And uh, Drew, you've been involved in the local meat issues. So tell us some perspective from where you stand. We, um, we use a, a small uh, local butcher. I actually dropped off two pigs this morning on the way here. <laughs> and then we also uh, process on farm. We are exempt from uh, the, uh, we, have, we operate under that USDA exemption. And um, we have uh, great success uh, having people um, come out and help us. <laughs> we have great success with uh, people who want to eat food, meat that's been grown on grass. Um, we find that uh, through the methods that we use of having cows and chickens on the same grass, the grass grows at an incredibly high rate of speed. And so as we move the animals around the property, everybody gets fed well. Um, the mm -hmm. end result is lean meat that's really delicious. Great. Well, thanks, Drew. Good Thank luck you. with that. I also want to call on one of my colleagues at USCA just because it, it's just such a stark juxtaposition, I think. So Colleen Ross here. Where's Colleen? Is she here? All right. This is your moment, baby. <laughs> so she's on the local meat committee. She's, she's blushing. She is blushing. <laughs> she, uh, she works in the chief office of the chief scientist in our research agency. I'm not sure if that mic's working. Is that mic working okay, do you think? So anyhow, yeah, she is actually thinking about the whole animal. Okay, so 
One of the things that we know from our colleagues over in Farm Credit is they say they go around, they talk to young people, and they say, how many of you want to be a farmer, you know, when you get out of school and all the hands go up? And then the next question is, how many of you have a business plan? And only two or three hands go up. And so there's really, you have to figure out the whole, the whole piece. And uh, so the, the thing that I wanted to ask Colleen is, I know one of the things that the local meat committee is looking at, and perhaps not everyone's talking about it in a big way, but it's the whole rendering part of the industry. So Colleen, you want to give us a little insight in some of your discussions? Um, so yeah, so I did not know I was going to be talking to you all today, but hello and welcome. <laughs> um, I started working at USDA in uh, May of 2010 and met Luke Knowles, who was uh, at that point helping out with the Know Your Farmer initiative. And one of the first things he asked me to look into was rendering, and I did not know what that word meant. Um, <laughs> but being very interested in kind of looking at waste streams and inefficiencies and uh, better ways to use them, I found the rendering industry to be quite an interesting one. Um, for those who don't know, rendering is uh, what happens to the parts of the animals that we don't eat and uh, how they're made useful in certain ways. There's a lot of different ways to dispose of um, the leftover bits. Composting is one, burying is another, but rendering was uh, an interesting one for me to look at um, as my first task on the New York Farmer team. Um, so we, we looked at how consolidation in the industry in a lot of different ways um, has been problematic for processors, for producers, and one of the issues that we found is that a lot of renderers have been going under um, around the country, and that leads to problems for processors. So, uh, yeah, so we're, we're looking into that, but uh, there's a lot of different ways that people are handling that issue, and uh, it's different in each part of the country, but it's definitely something that's on our radar here at USDA, so thank you. Thanks, Colleen. Got to talk about it all. Got to talk about it all. And speaking of it all, um, I know there's a young beekeeper in the house. Warren, where are you? How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. So you uh, you you keep you keep some hives? I do. How many do you got? I have four. Four hives. So uh, one of the the first year we planted uh, the garden. Uh, great to meet. Let me let me shake your hand. <laughs> great to meet you. Uh, we also put the first ever beehive on the White House grounds um, and. Uh, um, our beekeeper, Charlie, uh, who's, a, who's actually a carpenter and been a carpenter in the White House for now 29 years, I believe, um, kept bees in his, in his home, just like you. How long have you been doing it for? Um, I've been doing it for about two years now. Nice. Yeah. And uh, it's been amazing. Uh, I think we may need to do a little honey competition because I feel pretty <laughs> good about how, how tasty my honey is, but you look like you might produce some pretty good honey. Yeah. It's pretty delicious. It's pretty good. <laughs> All right, we may have to. We may have to swap. Did you bring any honey with you? Uh, I don't believe I did, but we can get that. You can get. It, you yeah. can get some for us. All right, we may have to swap some honey at the end of this. All right, sounds good. Um, but it's been amazing. So maybe you come down and, and, and check out our hive. Make yeah. sure we're doing okay. That'd be great. All right, we'll I'd do that it. afterwards. <laughs> uh, He's also a big chicken guy. So I joke with the Secret Service that the next thing is coming is is some chickens <laughs> down there, <laughs> and they look at me like. You're, you're crazy, but are you that crazy? Uh, so no, we're not going to do chickens, but that's, uh, that's, uh, that's pretty amazing. Um, well, congratulations. It's, the honey has been amazing. Uh, we have taken out incredible numbers in terms of the amount of honey we've gotten. It's incredible for the kids who come to see the garden, to see the pollination, see the whole process, uh, really learn uh, what it really means and how important pollinators are and bees are to, to what we eat. And, um, and it's been delicious. So it's, it's served a lot of purposes. Yeah, they're great. They're great, right? Yeah. So, so Erin, while you're up there and you got the mic, you know, one of the big things that, that we're struggling with is we have an aging farmer population. 30% of farmers, 65 years of age or older. We have this major transition that's going on in our working lands around the country. And the Secretary has said this is one of the major challenges for the forthcoming Farm Bill, to try to figure out ways to incent the next generation to go on our working lands. Yeah. From where, you, now I'm from, you're from my part of the world, by the way, I'm from Massachusetts. Yeah. Uh, from where you stand, what do you think some of the challenges are, things that we should be doing? Or do you think you would actually be a farmer full time in the future? What's, what's your um, thoughts? I'm not quite sure if I'd be a farmer when I grew up. Haven't thought about it or my business plan. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> definitely, uh, at least at my old school, uh, and now um, I'm a freshman in high school, and I'm starting, uh, at my old school, <laughs> I started a um, 
a farm club, which has now been continued on. And uh, actually just got out in spring break yesterday, but uh, when we get back, uh, our bees will have arrived, um, all the bee suits, all the equipment, so we'll get those set up. Um, so I've started um, bee clubs, and I, I think definitely uh, doing fun little things to get, uh, to get kids involved is definitely, it's definitely key because then it kind of um, gives them a little taste of what it's like. Uh, yeah, because definitely, I mean, having at least a bee club, it allows people to go out and see what bees are like and, you know, uh, eventually be able to harvest some honey. So getting, uh, getting kind of the youth and kids um, kind of just seeing what it's like and the kids who like it will really like it and the kids who don't, you know, you can't really um, change them very much. But definitely, I think, um, at least the way I think of it is, well, if I can start a club, then I can maybe get some other kids interested, and uh, you know, maybe then it'll grow on from there. But yeah, um, that's kind of at least what I've done, uh, which I, I think so far has been pretty successful. Well, great. That's well, amazing. Th th thanks for coming. I'm, I'm talking to Sam about trying to get you to see the beehive before yeah. the day's through. Yeah, we'll, That'd be we'll great. Get you out we'll to the garden. Out. All right. Okay. Well, you gave me a perfect segue to talk about another theme in the report, and that's farm to institution. We're talking K through 12 schools, we're talking colleges, hospitals, large institutions like uh, our cafeterias here in the government. Um, it's a great idea to have that farm, direct farm to the institution. To borrow a term from Massachusetts, it's wicked hard, WH, wicked hard to do. You've got issues of scale. You know, how do you get some of the small, mid-sized growers their product aggregated to the quantities that you need? You've got a lot of times institutional demands that be light processed. Um, you've got seasonality challenges when it comes to schools. And then you've got littler problems, just billing cycles, how it's done, having trucks on campus, food safety certifications. We love it, though, because it, it's money, um, it, better income for farmers, particularly those mid-sized farmers, you know, a little too big to be just at a farmer's market, not big enough to be in the, the export business or in, in major uh, travel ways of food. Um, can be a real economic foothold for them. Um, and so we have a number of things in the compass that talk about uh, farm to institution. We also talk about ag in the classroom. And I'm really big on ag in the classroom, always have been. Trying to get kids when they're young, like Oren, to talk about you know, the club stuff that you're doing, the kind of connecting kids uh, early on with how their food's grown. Some of the research we did at Tufts University, we found uh, Michelle Radcliffe found that um, kids who are engaged in garden-based learning, their willingness to try and their actual consumption of fruits and vegetables increase beyond what was grown in the garden, just because it was that entree, that thinking moment. Um, so we're really excited uh, about it. And I know that you, you mentioned uh, your friend here um, who is uh, I'm going to call on in a minute in terms of healthy food access as a college president. I know there's a lot of stuff going on. But I also wanted to call on uh, David and Nick Marvell, um, who are very involved in national farm to school efforts. I think they're way in the back there. You got both kids with you, your daughter too. You guys going to come up with your dad? Or are you hiding? <laughs> I mean, this is your moment. You can be live streamed from the White House. <laughs> It's your 15 minutes of fame. There you go. Help your dad out. <laughs> he might need it. <laughs> they look so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me what's going on from your perspective. What are the opportunities in farm to institution? What, we sh what should we be thinking about? Well, with farm, well, farm to school or farm to institution, you know, the biggest thing is, is distribution and, and being able to connect farmer to the institution, whether it's school or hospital. But in that is our opportunity. And it's people who have, are finding ways. Uh, Derek Kilmore from West Virginia is here, and he's also found ways. He's a farmer who's been able to connect other farms to his farm and be able to collaborate and be able to bring local product to an institution. So he's, you know, in Delaware and across the nation, I also represent the National Farm to School Network. And we're looking at people who basically we're picking on the low hanging fruit. We're, you know, we're working with uh, anybody who has. Uh, some kind of distribution already involved or ever already running and then work with farmers who don't and try to co-mingle that product and, and keep its identity. Excellent, excellent. So uh, um, 
we, we're really moving. One of the things we started early on at USA is set up the farm to school team. They went around the country. They tried to document what works, what doesn't. We've got a report on that on our website. We have a whole website on farm to school. Our national ag library put together an annotated bibliography so people don't have to reinvent the wheel. And, uh, and so there's a lot moving. So I really thank you for your leadership. And I bet you're looking forward to us getting out that uh, request for proposals for the farm to grant program. Uh, Yes, we the are. The farm to school program. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I'll commend the farm to school team because they went around the country looking at small and medium and large operations in schools, and they really, you know, got the, uh, the consensus of the country. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. If, if you're skipping school, I'm sorry they outed you. <laughs> Live from Delaware. Hello. Hello, Principal so-and-so. Thanks for coming. So I have a question that Amanda is showing me on the web. Farm institution, how can we assure, and maybe you guys can have some thoughts on this too, how can we assure that limited English and immigrant farmers participate in this important revenue stream? I'll start, and maybe you will add. Um, we certainly do have uh, a lot of our programs at USDA. If you're a beginning farmer or rancher, um, or if you are um, from a traditionally underrepresented population, socially disadvantaged population in terms of getting the largesse of USDA's resources, you get higher um, cost shares. Uh, so for example, when I was talking about the seasonal high tunnels that we, we saw um, that's at Butler's Orchards and elsewhere, uh, if you were uh, a mainstream farmer, you get 50% cost share. But if you are a socially disadvantaged farmer, you get 90% cost share. So we do have ways that a lot of our programs are weighted. Um, we do need to do better at USDA in translating a lot of our materials uh, and trying to get out more into immigrant populations. It's something we're working on. Um, and uh, I'm just going to take that as a challenge. Well, and Kathleen, it gives me an idea. Um, I think what we can do uh, at the White House, we work with so many different organizations, many of those working with recent immigrant populations. We can make sure they know about Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food, and, and know about this whole sector, I think, is a real opportunity for job creation. So my advice would be anyone looking for help on that, reach out to those institutions who maybe don't have anything to do with food or nutrition generally, but they'd be happy to be partners. And if I could just give a shout out to everyone tweeting with us here today, we've done, t I'll, I'll ask the White House uh, team and, and Chessie, we've done tweet outs on everything from women's issues to environmental issues to, I don't think we've ever had this kind of participation before. We're, uh, keep tweeting, we're probably on our way to a record here at the White House. <laughs> cool. I got a question submitted by Kate Clancy here in the room. In the future, will you be able to separate local from regional and index the latter for those interested in working at a larger scale. I'm going to go to even more basic question this prompts Kate. It, a lot of people ask me, well, how do you define local? Should we define local in law? And I say, no. I, I don't think we should because local is going to depend on where you live, what crop, what season, and it's also evolutionary. Right now, there are some places that can do more local and regional because they have infrastructure because they've taken advantage of some of these programs, because they've had some very exciting food entrepreneurs that are working there, and there are other places where it's just, it's not happening yet. And so we just have to be uh, respectful of that. On the other hand, I come from New England, and uh, local food is not necessarily confined by state borders, and it makes a lot of sense for regions to work together in the case of New England, the six agriculture commissioner of agriculture, it's commissioners of agriculture, blah, 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 um, they came together and said, we care about local regional food up here. Let's work together. And then they got together with their governors. It became part of the New England Governors Association strategic plan about how to build local food. We gave them up there a $250,000 cooperative grant, big money. big money. They turned it into millions. Hmm through the philanthropic community. So USDA's tiny dollars leveraged, but it wasn't really, I want to make a big deal of our 200, right. we would have turned it all around, but it was about people coming together and figuring out what could we do as a region. So I think it's going to evolve in different places, in different time periods, in different ways, and I think that is OK. I want to talk about healthy food access. Let's do it. And particularly, um, I'm going to, instead of starting off with my own little jazz here, I'm going to call on our, our, our local expert in the room, local via Dallas, Texas. Um, Michael Sorrell's here. 
And Michael is the president of Paul Quinn College. I'm going to bring you right up to the mic, sir, which is a small, traditionally African-American college. Yeah. And, uh, and I know you've been doing some exciting things on campus, so if you could give us a little glimpse, it would be great. Sure, and I want to thank you for the opportunity, and Sam, it's always good to see good you. To see. Uh, my name is Michael Sorrell, and as the Deputy Secretary said, I'm President of Paul Quinn College, and we are a small, historically black college in Dallas, Texas. We are 12 minutes from downtown Dallas, and we are firmly entrenched in a food desert. There's no grocery store for four to five miles from our campus, my students walk to the grocery store if they need food after hours. There's no uh, Walgreens, there's, I mean, no, no, nothing, right? No healthy food restaurants, nothing. And so we spent a couple years trying to get people to engage around this project. We even offered free land. We have 140 acres. We told any grocer that would build a grocery store, hire people from our community, hire students to work there, that we give them the land to build a store. No one took us up on it. So we got angry, we tore up our football field and created an organic farm, okay? In Texas? In, in Texas. I, I went to school in Texas. You uh, did that in Texas? We did that in Texas. You know, <laughs> luckily I'm not a little guy, so it, it made it a little bit safer, right? But the, uh, the reality of it is, in less than two years, we've grown over 5,000 pounds of food. Uh, we give away 10% of what we grow in a program called Tithing to the Community. Now, in case you think that you have to have some wonderful agriculture program to do this. We had none of that, right? We just had a will. We had a desire to know that people deserve better. And now we're still angry because we still don't have a grocery store. So we've decided to tear up the baseball field and build a grocery store. <laughs> so, and this, this, is, this is a true story. And thankfully to, you know, the, the White House and the folks here at USDA and Joni Walsh and others who have been very supportive and pointing us in the direction, and Sam, of places to go to get support for what we're doing. And so what I can promise you is that in the next year, we will break ground on a grocery store. Our farm is now going, in less than two years, its first expansion, because the Real Estate Council in Dallas has donated an irrigation system, which we were watering it with hoses in the Texas heat. Well, let me be clear. I wasn't watering it. The students were watering it, right? Uh, but we are getting an orchard. We are getting a greenhouse. We're getting an irrigation system and solar panel lighting uh, because people understand that if you stand up and try and do better for yourselves, other people will help you. And we are appreciative of that, but we are just warming up. So All thank right. you. Cool. Thank, thank you, Michael. That's and pretty exciting can stuff. Can I add one thing on access? Yeah. You know, uh, one of the pillars of the, of the First Lady's Let's Move campaign is ensuring that all families have access to healthy and affordable food. Um, and we know that, you know, as diverse as communities are, there's going to be that diversity and solutions. Um, but this is something that um, is at the core of what we're trying to do. Because while these issues are all, always going to be fundamentally about choice and, and families making choices that are best for them, for the families or people that are living in communities such as this, the notion of choice just means nothing to them. And, and it's at the heart of what we're doing. You cannot um, uh, serve your, you can't raise healthy kids who are eating healthy food if there is no healthy food around. So the first place that we went after uh, we launched Let's Move was to Philadelphia, where we visit First Lady visited a grocery store as part of their uh, fresh food initiative. That they had, this community hadn't had a grocery store in 10 years, in a decade. And you stop to think about that's from the time a kid is born to they're 10, or when they're 5 to they're 15, and so much of their habits will be shaped by that time. So we worked very hard. We're partnering with with. Uh, grocery stores across the country to build or refurbish 1,500 stores over the next five years, uh, impacting about 9.5 million Americans, uh, according to the companies. It's a big step in the right direction, but all these alternative strategies as well, with food trucks and, and local uh, community gardens, uh, Ample Harvest is doing amazing work uh, by collecting from community gardens all over the country, making sure it's getting to those in the greatest need. Uh, there's strategies happening all over the country, uh, but it's going to take all of these collective strategies to make this happen. But this is a top priority uh, for the administration for the First Lady. Excellent. Well, let me say, one of the things that you'll see on the Compass is where we have provided EBT, Electronic Benefit Transfer Technology, to farmers markets for redemption of federal nutrition benefits. Right now, you can see in 2010, we had 900,000 people in the country able to use uh, the WIC Farmers Market Nutrition Program benefit, women, infant, children benefit. Um, and you can see those on the map. 
in terms of density, where it is. Also, uh, the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program, 2.15 million people uh, redeeming benefits there. But what you don't see on the map currently is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, our largest nutrition program that USDA runs, formerly known as Food Stamps. And so I know Lisa Pino's in the house. And Lisa, I want, I want to know, are we going to get that SNAP data up there at some, some point? Where, where do you see this moving? I'll definitely work on getting that data up there as soon as possible. <laughs> um, but I did want to share that the good news is that the SNAP EBT farmers market business is literally booming. We now have about 2,500 SNAP authorized markets in the country. That's a third of all the markets in the U.S. That's triple the amount of SNAP EBT markets we had in 2008. Last year, more than $11 million was redeemed through SNAP EBT at farmers markets, and that's a 400% increase from the amount of redemptions in 2008. But this is fantastic news, not only because it economically empowers local and regional farmers, but also um, it expands their customer base, it expands jobs, uh, but conversely, it benefits by expanding access to fresh and healthy food in low-income, underserved communities. And that's so important because not only is affordability of fresh, healthy food so key, but it, it's really uh, even a more important message in the context of public health as the obesity epidemic continues to increase and all the chronic diseases that accompany obesity like diabetes and heart disease, et cetera. Um, but you know, we couldn't do this alone. We also have to acknowledge all the fantastic community partners we have out there. Um, I'll mention a couple like the Wholesome Wave Foundation that has done. They're in the house. They're yeah. in the house. Um, you guys have done outstanding work in increasing the financial incentives for folks when they spend their EBT dollars at farmers markets and also Snap Gardens is in the house and they've done a fantastic job of just promoting EBT use for seeds and seedlings which a lot of people don't even know that you can do. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention is that I think on page 62 of the Compass Report there's a great example of a nonprofit in Forest Grove, Oregon, I think it is, that expanded EBT use among immigrants and Hispanics. Um, so if you guys want to learn a little bit more, there's a great case study right in the report. Thanks. Great. Lisa Pino from FNS. Thank you very much. So I know Sam needs to head out, and uh, we only have a few minutes left. I do want to talk about local food knowledge, but Sam, I want to give you any parting shots. Um, you know. The only thing it says is it's just a, a phenomenal day, a phenomenal report, and phenomenal work. And thank you, everybody, for all the work you've been doing. You've laid the foundation for these efforts for, for decades. Uh, and you just know that you have our commitment to continue to build and, and bring people together around these set of issues. So, so thank you so much, and thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. All right. So actually I actually have two sections left. Yay, Sam. <laughs> hook me up. Hook me up with the, with the bees before your day ends. All right, careers and local food knowledge are the two less, less sections of the report I want to talk about. First, careers. Um, when, with Oren, we touched upon this, the, the need to repopulate our working lands. Um, when you go to this part of the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food compass, you'll see us talk about um, young farmers, beginning farmers, immigrant farmers, veterans, a lot of veterans coming back looking for employment. Um, Job Corps, how we even get kids in high school interested in agriculture through the Job Corps program. There's a lot of exciting things. We have really tried to work in this administration very closely with FFA mm -hmm. and 4-H. I was in 4-H, what about you? I was the treasurer in my local club. A 4-H, uh, not FFA. Yeah. They didn't have FFA where I was then. I mean, it just They had like it, I wasn't quite that cool. You weren't that cool. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, we, the secretary and I enjoy nothing more than when these young leaders come in. And when we talk about the 2012 Farm Bill, we say, let's not look about 2012, 13, 14. Yeah. Let's look where we need to go. Where, where are we going to be for these young people? So that's, that's the challenge. Um, I know that I have uh, Sabrina Madison here from Farm Bureau. And Sabrina's been great. She's the Director of Rural Affairs. And she's been a really close uh, colleague on all of this stuff. And, uh, if you just give us a little sense of what you think the challenges are, what we need to be doing. Uh, across the United States, there are um, concerns with the business transition of, of getting the farm from one generation to the next. And with the, the age of farmers um, and, and young farmers um, coming into the farm, it's really hard for the farmers to be able to bring their, the next generation into a farm operation as it is. 
and many of the far, uh, many of our farmers were finding are diversifying in order to to be able to bring that next generation back to the farm. In fact, this year at, at our annual meeting, we uh, awarded our achievement award, and four of the top five winners had some portion of their farm operation that was involved in retail agriculture. Um, farm Bureau has been involved in a, in a, a lot of support for for local and regional food, both at the at the national level with the Start to Farm project, which you heard about the beginning farmer initiative and and also with uh, state initiatives that that for example in Indiana they did a boot camp for for meat manager farmers market meat managers so that they would understand the new rules there are lots of, of um, farm farm bureau programs to support farm markets and farmers markets and uh, Wholesome Wave. I have to give kudos to Wholesome Wave who, who partnered with the San Diego County Farmers Market to, to give those double up food bucks. Um, we also have resources on online to, um, about careers and there are, we have a, a, the Ag in the Classroom program that we, that we work with and also uh, there are have a program called My American Farm, which is online games to introduce children to agriculture. Mm -hmm. And they can go online and, and see how, how that's, what it might be like to, to be involved in ca careers in agriculture. That's great. So we've got a lot of resources. We've got Start to Farm, we've got Farm Bureau, FFA, 4-H, Ag in the Classroom. But this is the biggest challenge in my mind facing American mm -hmm. agriculture today is getting that next generation in and successful. It's, uh, there are a lot of capital barriers, you know, and trying to get into American agriculture, a lot of challenges. With only 1% of Americans now directly from the farmer ranch, there's that, that, that broken connection for the passing on of knowledge. So we've got, we've got a big challenge. I go out on the road and I actually meet people who are in their 80s still dairy farming, not because uh, they want to, because that's a pretty hard 365-day-a-year job. You're probably milking three times a day. It's tough. But they just don't know who to pass the operation off to. So thank you. The last section I just want to touch upon is local food knowledge. Um, many of you might know that we're underway right now for the 2012 Ag Census. We'll be collecting some more information, including information about intermediated sales. When we talk about local food right now, all our data is really about a lot of it's based on direct sales and we want to get some more some more data that's good in the local food section you'll see about some of the research we're doing uh, you'll get a hyperlink to the plant hardiness zone map which USDA just released so it's uh, it's sort of got the color borders people wonder are the seasons changing when do I plant what we just reissued that tool that should be really great but there's a lot of work to be done in terms of data gaps. It's a big um, focus area of our work. And I would like to call on Dustin Joy Lane from the Grace Foundation in New York. Um, uh, among other things, you guys have the Eat Well Guide to give us a little sense of some of the research data issues that you're engaged with. Sure. Well, first of all, I have to say this is a dream come true. Um, I've actually been following USDA data for about 10 years. When I was a graduate student back at the University of Wisconsin, I was playing around with some of the first GIS systems when we were looking at mapping uh, food access and the USDA was just releasing data. So it's a thrill to be looking at it now and engaging in the data in a new way. I am the program director of our food work at Grace Foundation and you may be familiar with the Matrix um, Sustainable Table, our resource center, and the Eat Well Guide, which is our online directory of 25,000 hand-selected curated listings of the sustainable food movement. So we're really intimately connected with this data. And I was thrilled, let's see, I think it was last year when the USDA first started releasing the farmer's market data. And I had been in touch and we had been working in partnership with Real Time Farms and with uh, Food and Tech Connect and others to really look at how we can come together, all of the partners in this field, and, and say how can we support this data and engage with it in new ways and actually start looking at the government as a leader where then we can explore the, the ways that data can be applied so now looking at this, I think, think it's, um, 
incredible because we have this significant evolution for a government agency and we can really explore how to catalyze conversation and how to look at new innovation. This compass is just thrilling. It's, it's a dream come true. It's exciting. The innovation, all the applications that are possible, um, the, the ways we can map, the ways we can do mobile applications, the ways we can start looking at infographics and new ways that we can use data to tell the story is just at the frontier of where we're going. We had a Farm Bill Hackathon hosted by Food, Food and Tech Connect, uh, founded by Danielle Gold and Grace Communications. We sponsored this last December. We brought together 125 different folks in the technology field, field developers, designers, graphic artists, and then we also brought in food advocates to tell the story of the farm bill, of the food system. And we had this incredible day in New York City looking at new ways that we could tell the story. We built an application for Meatless Monday. We looked at new ways of telling about meat consolidation. Food and Water Watch was there talking about some of the issues in the meat industry. We had other partners all at the table. And what I'm here to do today is to say, we are committed to working with you to get this data out there in new ways so we can have developers explore the data and figure out how we can take it to new platforms. So I'm standing here in commitment with Food and Tech Connect and Grace saying we want to host another hackathon to explore the USDA data and to help really explore new frontiers for this work. You can follow us along at Eat Sustainable on Twitter and also Food and Tech Connect or Food Tech Connect. And, and please come play with us. Let's, let's take this somewhere. Okay, well great. Well, let me um, say we've got about five minutes uh, left, and uh, since we were just talking about our data, let me start um, with an apology. Look, this is a lot of data up there, you know, a lot of data points. Am I confident it's 100% right? Should we say good enough for government work? Uh -uh, no, I'm only kidding. <laughs> I, I mean, we've had a lot of vetting in this. We've done a lot of hard work. but. Um, there may be things where there are glitches. One, one point this afternoon, I was trying to hit a hyperlink in the compass uh, to hit a study, and it didn't come up properly. Let us know. Use the Know Your Farmer email address. Let us know of any technical problems that you find in the document or concerns that are raised. We have a team ready to respond. We want to know about it. We want to improve our tool. Um, this is a hallmark of transparency. It's a really important thing for us. and so. Uh, we made sure that all of our uh, data that sets that we've put up there are in um, Excel um, programams that you can download. Am I pronounce, saying that all right? Yeah. St spreadsheets, okay, old, old dog. Um, so uh, we want people to do with it what they want and figure out and give us feedback. That's, that's, that's all good stuff. Um, I also got a question from Hilde Steffi at FarmAid wondering how can farmers share their stories with the USDA, both successes and challenges, um, so we can serve them better? I think that's a really great um, question. I, I don't know exactly how all the compass is going to evolve, but we, again, are going to be repopulating with more stories, more case studies. Um, I think the case studies put the flesh on it. You get the data. That's important. I'm not saying data is not important and all that, but when you know someone in your community, um, I think that really makes a difference. I also got a question, um, will there be a section of the compass for children for education and fun? Frankly, I hadn't thought about that. So all these different tweets that are coming in, I just want to assure everybody that as deputy, I'll be reviewing them all, the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food task force will be reviewing the tweets, figuring out if there are things that have come up that we really should be thinking about that we may not have already. And then I also got a question, do you plan on releasing farm data? I don't know. That might be the Farm uh, Service Agency is uh, where a lot of farmers get their operating loans or farm ownership loans. The way we've tried to represent that is if you go to the state office um, where FSA is, you click on that and it will tell you how much in the loan portfolio for that year FSA went to farmers. And then in um, right now, about half of the states, and very soon all the states, will have three or more profiles of farmers that will say, so-and-so got an operating loan. And these are people who are deliberately working in the local regional food space. So we are trying to get out that information. Not try We're trying to represent people's personal data, but so it doesn't say, 
so and so got X dollar loan, but it, and and all these farmers and ranchers have been very kind. They've all signed waivers. They say yes, you could put me up there as an example. So um, they're out there, and um, I hope that helps people get a sense of what the range of services are from from USDA. John, do you have some final comments well, before I'm, we go dark? Um, I'm leaving this uh, more excited than I was coming in. I first just want to congratulate USDA, the entire team that's here today. This is what President Obama envisions for the federal government, government being a partner, concrete examples, concrete solutions. And my challenge to all of you, this is clearly, I knew it was coming in, but not to this extent. This is a connected community. This is a community that's growing. My challenge to everyone following online here in the audience is on your way back home today while you're tweeting, think of a couple people who you know who aren't part of this conversation. There's so many challenges we're facing in this country today. As someone recently said, we're at halftime in America and we know that we're heading in a great direction. But this is a set of issues that everyone can be involved in. Everyone can feel like they're part of the team making a difference. From the consumer end, using Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food to make smart local choices, um, to starting your own bee club at high school. Um, please help us uh, spread the word, and we'll continue to do that, too. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you all for coming. I know some of you came great distances. Those of you out in cyberspace, hello there. Um, uh, great to have you. Let's continue the conversation at hashtag KYF2. Thanks, everybody.